Welcome back to the Her Advantage podcast. I am your host, Mel, and this is episode number 48. It is just you and me in this episode today. I really want to dig into an Instagram post that I put up this week, and it was a pretty short and sweet statement, but it sparked a couple of really cool conversations. Now, the social media or the real post that I did simply said, I know that your doctor is downplaying it, but you're not imagining it. It's also not your doctor's responsibility to educate you on your body. Now, this is absolutely not medical advice. This conversation comes from years of me being a clinical exercise physiologist and working in the chronic health space. It's come from me healing my own hormonal and health issues, and it has come from me working with women to go from feeling completely depleted and defeated to feeling energized and confident in their bodies. Now, the quote or the comment is pretty potent and packed with a bit of punch. It was actually, you know, one of those things that I was like, "Mm, I don't think that I should say this. It's a little bit harsh and abrupt, but it's the truth. It is not your GP's job to educate you on your body. Now, one of the biggest things that I want to make comment on and draw attention to is the fact that if you have spent years trying to understand your body, if you have spent years trying to understand what the fuck is going on and trying to put pieces together, and you've probably tried lots of different things, you've probably tried medications, you've probably tried going to see different modalities like naturopaths or chiropractors or just trying to get some one relief and two, some answers. But if you're constantly being passed around from specialist or professional to professional and, or being told that, you know, this is just the way your body is. And this is something that you're going to have to learn to manage for the rest of your life. It really starts you on the path of fuck, this is it. And that causes your mental health to take a massive excuse me, dive. So it starts our journey of one, trying to come to terms with the fact that maybe what we're feeling is just it and that it's likely never going to change, but we're feeling fucking uncomfortable and like it's not something that we want to carry through the rest of our lives. And so it really starts that inner challenge of going, fuck, this is just it. Maybe you should stop looking for answers or you know, am I imagining this? Is this really it? So like I said, it really causes our mental, our mental or emotional health to really take a dive. And you've got to imagine like, this isn't, you've spent years trying to figure these answers out. You've spent years trying different things. So it's not a mindset change that we completely flick a switch on and change overnight, but it is something to consider that the more you get told that this is the way you are, that this isn't going to change. You just have to learn to manage this. The longer it kind of takes to untangle from all of the years of being told the certain things. Now there's three things that I want to address that have maybe come to this conclusion that, you know, it is not your GP's job to educate you on your own body. And the first and probably the most surprising thing. If you haven't heard this before, I'm really sorry that I'm the one that's telling you this. Women weren't included in scientific research until the seventies, which means that every medication, every test, every condition was essentially based on theory or male data or rat data, maybe animal data, but definitely not female specified research and data. Yes, I know the 70s was a while ago, whether we want to believe that or not, but there's also like a catch up period in that. So yes, women are now being studied and included in testing and we understand the female physiology and anatomy so much more, but you've got to imagine that, you know, that takes time to start really collecting and understanding that data. So it's not like, you know, you do one scientific research with a cohort of women and all of a sudden the medical industry changes. It takes years to overcome this, not to mention the fact that probably most of the testing and the research that you started to explore, your professionals started to help you explore with, like I said, was based off male data. So 
every test result that you had, every conclusion that you had, if it didn't work, it was because it, they weren't relating it to someone like you. And I think I have this like theory that of course, like it's the doctor, it's in, like they have this ego that it's like, oh, I can fix you. Let's try this thing. Let's try that thing. Instead of actually looking at the person in front of them and understanding what research is coming up for them or understanding what um, um, data is coming up, it's just this like, oh, I'm going to do it, which is very weird to me because when I reflect on my university and master's degree, literally the one thing that I took away was being able to critically analyze what was in front of me, not actually just go, well, that's what the, that's what the research says. So that's what must be true. But the other thing is that you're already then in this cycle of like being tested and told negative results and, but you don't worry, we're going to keep testing you. So they kind of keep you in this false sense loop and it's just making you feel shitter and shitter. And like I said before, it kind of keeps you in this cycle of, emotional and mental abuse. Like it's, it's not a nice feeling to be told that there's no answers and this is just it. The second thing that I want to speak to is that, you know, we talk about this from a scientific point of view and a science and a like medical research point of view. But the next thing is that our grandparents and even our parents weren't taught about their bodies so they could only pass on to you essentially the little bits that they learnt. Now, we are living in one of the most educationally rich eras. Um, I was talking with another lady on my podcast a couple of episodes ago that, you know, the education that we have today, we are more educated. The general population is more educated than royalty was even a, se- a decade or a century ago. Like the research that we have at our fingertips now puts us way ahead of the game. Like I said, that was once reserved for very special people. So, you know, count yourself lucky. But the re- the way that I came to realize this, I was recently reading my grandma's memoirs. My grandmother was born 1913 in Europe and she was an only child. And the memoir reads that, you know, essentially when she first got her period, Basically, her mum said to her, like, you need to now this start thinking about creating a family. And really, if you entertain the idea of a boy, you could fall pregnant. So just be aware of that. That was the extent of her knowledge. And she spoke about that in her, like, understanding of what was happening with her own menstrual cycle and all of that, it was the first time that she actually realized that she had, she wished she had a sister so that she could have someone to talk about these things with, but it just was not spoken about with each other. And so again, that lack of community and the lack of conversation and the lack of awareness to to recognize when something wasn't right or was right or even know what was normal. It just wasn't a spoken about thing. And that's been passed on for generation to generation. So point one, scientific research didn't acknowledge anything that was happening in our bodies. Our own generations before us didn't recognize and it wasn't spoken about. So here we are in this really um, education rich era and we kind of don't know what to do with it because it's uncomfortable and new knowledge and it's fucking powerful if we're being completely honest to walk into so point three on that is that women's bodies women's needs women's energy is so dynamic it is forever changing and it, it doesn't stay the same, which I think is pretty freaking cool, but it also lay, it adds in a layer of complexity into our needs. So as a woman, when you finally understand, oh yes, like I feel good in my body. This is what, you know, we're doing the right thing. This is it. It's almost like we turn another corner and your body's like, guess what lady, this is the new thing that you have to try and figure out, which is kind of mean. But it's also kind of cool because it means our body is constantly adapting and growing and we're not stagnant things. Like imagine if I have this really beautiful tree out the front of my room and I love watching it go through the different seasons. 
imagine if we we didn't have our different seasons. Imagine if we didn't change. It was just the same our entire life. You know, when you look back at, you know, in five-year increments and think about all the fond memories that you had, and maybe there are some not-so-fond memories there too, but, you know, each five-year chunk, you kind of learn something about yourself and you learn a little bit more and you come into a little bit more. And this is the dynamic of being a woman. It's it's a really beautiful process. Another podcast I did with Brooke a little while ago, you know, she mentioned that women are no longer talking about being at 40 and 50 as middle age. 40 and 50 is really coming in to the peak of your life because you have this education and you have this awareness about how the world works and you have this innate knowledge about your body. So you can finally start to put it to good use and step into your life with a little bit more oomph. So this is also where if you think about these three components, you know, the lack of medical research, the lack of generational support and conversation and the dynamic needs of our body, we're not just looking at this from a physical standpoint. We're not just talking about this in terms of a biological standpoint Uh, a nutritional standpoint or a mental health standpoint, the three of them really come in together. And so our emotional and physical needs aren't two separate things. And yet when we have something wrong with us, we typically dive into one or the other. We don't, we go and get support for our mental health or we go and get support for our physical body. And I think the sooner that we realize the two are so intertwined and so interconnected, the quicker we have more power to be able to change the discomfort in our body. And I know that sounds really airy fairy, um, but it's true. And yes, there are certain incident, ins, God, incidences that are going to make us go one way or the other. So for example, I know that when I'm in a really big season of loving my exercise and pushing myself in the gym I can tell when I'm not eating enough because my energy dips. Or if I'm in a really busy season with my work and trying to grow and trying to develop and trying to create new products, I know it's typically my mental or emotional capacity that's probably being tested. And so that's probably where I need to look. But being able to distinguish these two things also comes from the years of understanding my body's needs and putting these pieces of the puzzle together. And it's the same with the women that I work with. I work with fucking busy and exciting women. These women know they have a purpose in life and big creations that they want to do. And they need to know if there is a leak in the hose, where to fill it and not just try haphazard things to get them where they need to be. It needs to be an exact measure and an exact science to put them one foot in front of the other and to get them out of their own way. And yes, again, it is a process of learning because if you have come from years, like I said, of constantly being told that this is just how it is, or even if you're someone who is like a yo-yo dieter and is on and off different diet trains, then you're kind of going to be thinking that, you know, if you do this thing for a certain amount of time, that things will change. Whereas, like I said, we're dynamic beings. So we need to be able to work with the seasons in our body, the seasons in our life, the seasons that we go through as we age to be able to give our body what it needs. So there are a couple of questions that I want you to think about if you have never heard of, you know, never really heard that the health and human body spoken about like this. And those three questions are, if you were to really think about it, what are the three things that give you energy? And I don't want you to answer them straight away. I want you to mull it over. Sit there, close your eyes, take a deep breath for a second. What are the three things that give you energy? What are the three things that give you energy? What are the things that you feel like gives you energy? Is it food? Is it a good night rest? Is it spontaneous trips away with the girls? Is it sitting down and doing an art practice? Is it, do you fucking love your job? Like what are the things that bring you instantaneous energy? 
you know, if you think about like, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon and you're feeling a little bit like, oh, Monday's tomorrow. I really just need to collect myself and think about what I need for tomorrow. And somebody calls you and says, hey, do you want to come and do this thing with me? What is the thing that they're saying? This doesn't have to be as clean cut, as good food, as good exercise, as a good night's rest. When we think about the things that give us energy, it is so much broader than that. The second question that I want you to ponder is, how do you know when it's time to let go of things that aren't working? How do you know when it's time to let go of the things that aren't working? I really get annoyed when people ask me this question. So I really hope that you don't roll your eyes at me when I've asked you this, because it's often one of those questions that I'm like resentful to, as in like, what do you mean? I don't hold on to shit that I don't need. And all of a sudden, if I think about it, I'm like, "Mm, that's probably not working as much as I'm, I'm definitely avoiding this. So again, where this question comes from is more so, you know, I think we really have this idea that we love to look after and nurture our body and we do things that are really healthy. But if if we're the activities that we're doing and like the food that we're eating, the exercise that we're doing, if we're not waking up in the morning feeling good, can you really say that the things that you're doing are healthy for you? Is it sustainable and supportive of you feeling good in your body? So what are some of the things that you might need to revisit or let go of in order to actually feel good? I know one of the big things for me was letting go of a hectic exercise routine. You know, when I first really came to head with all of my hormonal issues, I was training CrossFit six days a week and I was just a complete mess, but I was doing all the right things. I was exercising. I was strength training. I was eating really healthy and clean. And my body was like, nah, mate, this is, this is not, this is not good. And I refused. I was a clinical exercise physiologist at this stage as well, which makes it so much more embarrassing because I was someone who was teaching people about how to feel good in their body using exercise. And my body had to crash and burn for me to realize that exercise alone is not going to take you where you want to be in your body. The third question, and it kind of links into this last one, is how can you trust a change of direction? So again, if you have spent years, you know, in this cycle, in these loops with your medical professionals or eating a certain way, and you know that your body is not what you, you know, you don't want to feel in your body. How can you actually trust a change of direction when nothing has worked for you before? Or if it has worked for you before, it's only worked for a short amount of time. How can you really trust that change of direction? The short answer is you really can't. But you know, if you can deeply listen into yourself that you know you deserve better, that you know you want to feel better, then you have to you have to take a leap. Now, the beauty of the work that we do inside Her Advantage is that there's always data points and things that we're looking for feedback on. So it's not a matter of going, oh, I'm doing this diet for six weeks and I'm going to lose five kilos or I'm doing this diet for six weeks so that I can eliminate some certain gut bacteria and then, you know, we're going to do this other thing. Every morning we are waking up, we are asking ourselves a set of questions, we're asking ourselves for feedback so that we can in ourselves know, oh, this is pointing us in the right direction. But you're also building trust with your body. Trust with a body that has felt so foreign and so uncomfortable for so many years, even though you have been so working so hard at doing the right thing to try and make yourself feel good. We are redirecting that trust so that you can trust the seasons in life and the change of direction. Now that's enough for me because I'm hungry and I need to go and eat and I can feel, I can feel like the passion seeping out of this conversation. So as always, if you found this conversation useful, please share your takeaways with me. Um, Share it with someone that you uh, also might think is useful. And until next time.